Jorge Luis Borges' short story, The House of Asterion, is kind of haunting in part because of one of the central features of the story as it's told through the eyes of Asterion. And there's a few paradoxical aspects to it as well that we'll get to. And it's essentially the story of the Minotaur being told from his point of view rather than that of Theseus, who we encounter at the very end of it, where he says, can you believe it, Ariadne? The Minotaur scarcely defended himself. And we jump out of frame in that. So before that, we get Asterion revealing his own mindset and some interesting, let's call them puzzles, wrapped up in it, sort of suggested for us. So Asterion begins by telling us, I know I am accused of arrogance and perhaps of misanthropy and perhaps even of madness. And he says, these accusations, which I shall punish in due time, are ludicrous. So already there, well, maybe he is kind of crazy thinking he's going to punish these accusations. Maybe it is arrogance and misanthropy. He's almost confirming to us what it is that he's being accused of. And we'll come back to that in a moment. There's another paradoxical aspect. So he's going to tell us, like the philosopher, arguably Plato in um, the Phaedrus, but perhaps some other philosopher prior to that who didn't write things down as Plato did. I think that nothing can be communicated by the art of writing. Vexatious and trivial minutia find no refuge in my spirit. I have never grasped for long the difference between one letter and another. I haven't learned to read. I regret that because the nights and days are long. So we can say, well, okay, then how are you actually communicating to us? Because it seems like it's in writing. And what is your frame of reference by which you understand that it would be nice to be able to read books. So th that tells us that we're dealing with something a little bit fabulous here. Perhaps we shouldn't pull at those strings too much. Now, going on, Asterion is going to tell us two things about his house, which is the title of the story. Anybody can come in and he can go out. So he says, I never leave my house, but it's true that it's doors whose number is infinite. And here we have a footnote saying the original reads 14, but there's more than enough cause to conclude that when spoken by Asterion, that number stands for infinite. We're going to come back to that point in a bit. So it's doors who are, whose number is infinite stand open night and day to men and also to animals. <clears throat> Anybody who wishes may, to enter may do so. No womanly splendors, no palatial ostentation shall be found, only calm and solitude. So it's a very, you know, Spartan, as we say, sort of environment. And then he goes on and says, even my detractors admit there is not a single piece of furniture in the house. And we'll come back to the structure of the house in just a bit. The second part, he says, I'm not a prisoner, you know, and if this is the Minotaur and we're talking about the uh, labyrinth, it was sort of a, a prison originally to house this half, uh, half man, half bull from a child all the way up into its adulthood. But he says that um, the door stands open. There is no lock. One afternoon, I did go out into the streets. If I returned before nightfall, I did because the terrible dread inspired in me by the faces of the people. The people prayed, fell, fled, uh, fell prostrate before me. Some climbed up the stillabite of the temple of the axes. Other gathered stones. One, I believe, hid in the sea. His, his conclusion is, I cannot mix with commoners even if my modesty should wish it. No, he doesn't actually have modesty, does he? So we're going to find out that Asterion considers himself to be unique. And we come back to some of the things he's telling us about writing. He tells us that his spirit has been formed for greatness. And I want to pause on this for a moment. So 
Borges is writing of an ancient, legendary creature, and he's also a product of an intellectual culture that has gone from ancient times all the way up to modern times. And there's a term here that we might have lost sight of. So, greatness of spirit. What we in the past would call great solidness or magnanimity, right? This was viewed as there's different ways of thinking about it. perhaps a part of courage by the Stoics, the crowning of the virtues uh, by Aristotle. It's, it's a virtue that's mentioned but not described overly by Plato. It was held to be something quite important. So that Asterion actually considers himself to have great spirit means that it makes sense. I, why would I learn to read? A generous impatience has prevented me from that. You know, vexatious and trivial minutia find no refuge in my spirit. So he's not going to be all that careful and he doesn't, you know, spend time learning those sorts of things. Later on, he's going to suggest that everything is repeated in the universe except for two things, two things in the world that apparently exist but once, on high the intricate sun and below Asterion. The intricate sun, isn't that an interesting way to talk about it? He tells us what he does with his time. He enjoys playing games and some of these, he says, I run like a charging ram through the halls of stone until I tumble dizzily to the ground. Sometimes I crouch in the shadow of a wellhead or at a corner of one of the corridors and pretend I'm being hunted. There are rooftops from which I can hurl myself until I'm bloody. I can pretend any time I like that I am asleep and lie with my eyes closed and my breathing heavy. So he's got all sorts of ruses as if he were playing with another person. And then he talks about his favorite game, the game of another Asterion, where he pretends that he has come to visit me and I show him around the house. Bowing majestically, I say to him, now let us return to our previous intersection or let us go this way now out into another courtyard or I knew that you would like this rain gutter or now you will see a cistern that is filled with sand or now you will see how the cellar forks. Sometimes I make a mistake and the two of us have a good laugh over it. So this is quite an elaborate inner life externalized into his house that he is exhibiting, telling us about here. And then he, he spends a lot of time thinking about the house. So he's not just a child. He's not just a beast. He's also somebody who considers his environment. And he tells us the following. Each part of the house occurs many times. Any particular place is another place. There is not one wellhead, one courtyard, one drinking trough, one manger. There are 14, an infinite number of mangers, drinking troughs, courtyards, wellheads. And we're going to come back to that tantalizing number thing in just a moment. Before that, though, he says something which kind of prefigures where we're going with that. He says, the house is as big as the world, or rather, it is the world. So two different statements there. The house that he's living in is big as the world, so we could put them side by side, or it is the world itself. The house is the entire cosmos. And he's going to suggest that perhaps I have created the stars and the sun in this huge house and no longer remember it. But how can this actually be when we know that the house has doors and he can not only can exit the house, but has exited the house and that other people, as we're going to learn very shortly, come in from outside. So there's something strange going on here. And I think that maybe the clue to this is in this identification uh, by the narrator who's telling us from the outside, what it is that Asterion means of 14 with infinite. And now notice that these are numbers 
for qualifying things, for counting things, right? It is not the number itself. It is not 14 equals infinity. It is that 14 of something means infinite number of that something. So now we come to it, right? So there, there are 14 doors, infinite doors. There are 14 wellheads, courtyards, drinking troughs, mangers, uh, infinite. And he says, by making my way through every single courtyard with its wellhead and every single dusty, dusty gallery of gray stone, I've come out on the street and seen the temple of axes in the sea. That night I did not understand until a night vision revealed to me that there are also 14, an infinite number of seas and temples. Everything exists many times, 14 times, infinite times, right? So what this means is that in his counting system, 14 does in fact stand for infinite and the things that he's making sense, the things that he's saying about the house and the world could make sense if we think about the equation of the finite with the infinite. How can they be brought into, let's call it commensurability with each other? That's not answered here. It's just a that, not a how, and also not a why. But what we get is that some finite thing could stand in for signifying the infinite, an infinite number of things. So things don't actually have to be infinite in order to be a labyrinth, to use one of Borges' favorite metaphors, right, that recurs throughout his work, with finite structure, parts, which in a certain way maps onto the infinity of the universe. It finishes up by talking about a ritual. He mentions every nine years, nine men come into the house so I can free them from all evil. And now we get a different sort of concept here, right? We've talked about whether he's a prisoner, his magnanimity. We've got this interesting cosmological reflection about 14 and infinite. And now we're talking about good and evil. So he's going to purge them, free them from all evil. He runs joyously to find them. The ceremony lasts but a few minutes. One after another, they fall without my ever having to bloody my hands. Why not? Because perhaps he uses his horns or his hooves, right? Where they fall, they remain in their bodies, help distinguish one gallery from the others. So there's a specification that happens through dying. And he says that one of them predicted as he died, someday my redeemer would come, somebody who would free me from evil. And then he says, since then there's been no pain for me in solitude because I know my redeemer lives and in the end he will rise and stand above the dust. If I, my ear could hear every sound of the world, I would hear his footstep. I hope he takes me to a place with fewer galleries and fewer doors, a, a place that is genuinely finite. And then he says, what will my redeemer look like? And here he goes through a combinatorics, right? He could be a man. He could be a bull. He could be a bull with the face of a man, or perhaps he'll be like me, a minotaur. And that is, aside from the little vignette about uh, Theseus having killed him, that is where the story ends. We're through exploring in just a few pages, this incredibly suggestive picture, not just of Asterion as a character, but what a labyrinth would actually be and how it could, in some respect, be a stand-in for the entire universe by equating something finite with the infinite.